Ranjini, good afternoon. Ranjini, can you hear good me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, ma'am. Every king. எல்லாருமே <laughs> 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 டென்ஷனா இருக்கு மொபைல் டேட்டா தான் இங்க அந்த மொபைல் டேட்டால வந்து எந்த அளவுக்கு எப்படி இருக்க போதுன்னு தெரியல சோ ஃபார் வந்து வி ஹவ் கண்டக்டட் ஒன்லி फ्रॉम आवर ஹோம் சோ அதனால எந்த பிரச்சனையுமே இல்லாம இருந்தது ஓகே ஓகே காலேஜ்ல இருந்து இவங்க காலேஜ்ல இருந்து காமன் வைஃபை அந்த மாதிரி கொடுக்கல எல்லா மொபைல் டேட்டா யூஸ் பண்ணி பண்ணிட்டு இருக்கோம் இப்ப கிளாसेस எடுத்துட்டு இருக்கோம் அதுல பெரிய ப்ராப்ளமாவே இருக்கு ஓ ஓகே 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 சரி மேம் அதுதான் <laughs> 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 Our uh, students have joined through YouTube link, our college YouTube link. Okay, 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 okay. Sure, 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 sure. Mm-hmm. Arul, Arul sir, one time. Will ஹலோ கேக்குதாங்க குட் மார்னிங் ஆ நல்லா இருக்கேன் நீங்களா எப்படி இருக்கீங்க ரொம்ப நாளைக்கு அப்புறம் நம்ம மீட் பண்றோம் ஆமா ரொம்ப வருஷம் நாள் தெரியாது எக்ஸாக்ட்லி நமக்கு மார்னிங் அவங்களுக்குலாம் ஆஃப்டர்நூன் எக்ஸாக்ட்லி ஆமா ஆமா நினைக்கிறேன் <laughs> 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 <laughs>
good afternoon ma'am ma'am may i say some instructions to participants ah yes ma yes ma thank you ma'am believe the science of chemistry alone almost proves the existence of an intelligent creator as thomas alva edison believed everything is theoretically impossible until it is done very good afternoon and welcome you all with a happy heart dear participants for your kind notification you are requested to mute your audio and video throughout the session if you have any queries kindly post it in the chat box we will bring them up at the end of the session feedback link will be posted in the chat box at the end of the session let's wait for few more minutes to join all the participants Dr. Anjani and Dr. Professor Murugan, shall we start? Yes, madam. Yes, sure. Yeah. Yes, madam. Oh, okay. Let us start this uh, international scientific meet uh, through this prayer song. Nivetha, you can yes, start now. Yes, ma'am. Sure, ma'am. pray then let it go don't try and manipulate or force the outcome just trust god to open the right doors at the right time let's start the session with a prayer song works in way we cannot see he will make a way for me he will be my guide hold me closely to his side with love and strength for each new day he will make a way he will make a way to be no way you were sent 
For the sacred soulful prayer song it's a pleasure having you all here somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known we know that knowledge without application is simply knowledge applying the knowledge to one's life is wisdom and that's the ultimate virtue when we have broad knowledge of life then we have broad range of skills international scientists meet a college try to provide a great chance for students to listen to different points of view and learn new ideas and trends in our field especially students can get opportunity to broaden their thinking and knowledge to succeed in your mission you must have a single minded devotion to your goal a quote by dr apj abdul kalam so we are in quarantine period holy cross college try to equip our students with appropriate skills knowledge and morals through webinar at this juncture we are happy to conduct this international scientist meet on the topic computational chemistry and biophysical chemistry now i call upon dr roslyn vimala ma'am president of chemistry association department of chemistry holy cross college to welcome the august gathering person holds so much power within themselves that needs to be let out sometimes they just need a little nudge a little direction a little support a little coaching and the greatest things can happen says peter carroll good afternoon everyone on behalf of the pg and research department of chemistry i welcome you all for this international scientist meet on computational chemistry and biophysical chemistry successful people tend to always want to continue learning it is likely part of what makes them successful in the first place they want to learn and discover new and different things to feed their curiosity and zest for life yes we have in our midst two such eminent people dr sri ranjini armugam and professor arul murugan the goal of the biophysical chemist is to provide physical explanations for the ways in which important biological systems function techniques needed 
To reach this goal are drawn from many disciplines, including chemistry, physics, and biology. Dr. Sri Ranjani Armugam, a senior scientist at Leipzig University, Leipzig, Germany, a notable alumni of our institution, is an expert scientist in the field of biophysical chemistry. She did her master's at American College Madurai, got her doctoral degree at IIC Bangalore for studying biomolecular interactions using nonlinear optical methods. Man has studied DNA replication and repair using bulk and single molecule spectroscopic methods during her postdoctoral stay as a National Institute of Health Fellow at the Pennsylvania State University State College, USA. She is the recipient of research grants, is highly skilled in overseeing research activities, and also being a public science communicator. Ma'am has published many papers in internationally reputed journals. She is also the mentor to UG, PG, and PhD students. Being experienced, detail-oriented, specialized in this area, as well as developing new applications and products, she has worked as a research scientist from the year 2013-2020 at Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry, Germany, and is currently working as a senior scientist at Leipzig University, Germany. She is now at present carrying out her research work on exploring the spectral properties of diamonds for biological systems using imaging and sensing. Ma'am, I'm extremely glad to welcome you on behalf of the PG and Research Department of Chemistry to be a part of this International Scientist Meet. Welcome, ma'am. Chemists have been doing computations for centuries, but the field we know today as computational chemistry is a product of the digital age. Martin Kaplas, Michael Levitt, and Aria Washell won the 2013 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the work that they did in the 1970s, laying the foundation for today's computer models that combine principles of classical physics and quantum physics to better replicate the fine details of chemical processes. However, computational chemistry was not generally thought of as, as it is own distinct field of study until 1998, when Walter Kahn and John Popel won the Chemistry Nobel Prize for their work on density functional theory and computational methods in quantum chemistry. The computational chemist daily work influences our understanding of the way the world works, helps manufacturers design more productive and efficient processes, characterizes new compounds and materials, and helps other researchers extract useful knowledge from mountains of data. Computational methods are rapidly becoming major tools of theoretical, pharmaceutical, materials, and biological chemists. Yes, we have in our midst one such person who is marching towards to be in line with the aforesaid laureates is an established computational chemist, Professor N. Arunmurugan. He is currently employed as a senior researcher, folk say, at the Department of Theoretical Chemistry and Biology, School of Chemistry, Biotechnology and Health, KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Sir did his PhD in Computational Chemistry from the Indian Institute of Science in 2005 for his thesis entitled Molecular Simulations of Temperature-Induced Disorder and Pressure-Induced Ordering in Organic Molecular Crystals. He was appointed as docent, that is Associate Professor in Theoretical Chemistry and Biology from the year 2015 and his employment as a researcher started at the same department in 2011. He had postdoctoral stays during 2006 to 11 at University Leibert D, Bruxelles, Royal Institute of Technology, Sweden, and Polytechnical University of Catalonia, Spain. And his visits were funded by internationally recognized postdoctoral grants sponsored by Belgian National Fund for Scientific Research. Renner Gren Foundation and Spanish Ministry of Science and Innovation. He has rich research experience in material science and bioscience for more than 15 years and published more than 110 publications and peer reviewer international journals, including Science Advances, JAX, Biosense, Bioelectron, etc. He had delivered more than 40 invited talks in conferences and international academic institutions and has supervised more than 10 students in the postdocs from 2011 onwards. He is teaching various courses at CBH school from, to, from the year 2013, physical biochemistry, biomolecular structure and function, and drug development. He has also completed pedagogical training at KTH Learning Lab. 
Sir, he specialized in studying molecular probes, diagnostic agents, and optical probes in heterogeneous bio and solvent environments using multi-scale modeling approaches. Sir, having explored the research interface between computational chemistry and mathematical science, is currently involved in the development of quantum mechanics and machine learning based codes for predicting various drug-like properties of organics for the applications of therapeutics and diagnostics for neurodegenerative diseases and infectious diseases. I welcome you, sir, and wholeheartedly appreciate for accepting our invitation and deliver a talk on computational approaches for drug discovery. I also welcome a dynamic head of the Department of Chemistry, Holy Cross College, Dr. A. Lima Rose, the faculty members of our department, the research scholars, and the student friends, and making this International Scientist Meet a memorable occasion with you all your prayerful support. Once again, I welcome you all. Thank you, ma'am, for your cordial welcome. We now request our Honorable Head of the Department, Dr. A. Lima Rose, ma'am, Associate Professor, Department of Holy Cross College, to deliver the felicitation. Good afternoon to all. Good afternoon to everybody present here. On behalf of the PG and Research Department of Chemistry, Holy Cross College, I feel very proud to have a prominent, our beloved and eminent alumna, Dr. Sri Ranjini, senior scientist, Leipzig University, Germany, to be here and give a talk on nitrogen vacancy center in diamond as a sensor. Thank you, Dr. Ranjani, for accepting our invitation and also your continuous support in all the events of your parent department. Thank you, Dr. Ranjani, for your timely help on arranging Professor Murugan, Senior Researcher, Department of Theoretical Chemistry, Royal Institute of Technology, Sweden. Thank you, Professor Murugan, for graciously accepted to be here and give a talk on computational approaches for drug discovery. The theme of this International Scientist Meet on computational and biophysical chemistry is to share the scientific knowledge among students, research scholars, faculties, with the help of scientists who are present here. This meet shares an insight into the recent researches and cutting-edge te technologies which gains immense interest with a close, colossal and exuberant presence of adults, young and brilliant researchers and talented student communities. The goal of this meet is to bring together a group of scientists from other countries to present and exchange breakthrough ideas relating to chemistry. It promotes top level research and to globalize the quality research in general, thus making discussions, presentations more internally competitive and focusing attention on the recent outstanding achievements in the field of chemistry. A common forum like this is essentially required to discuss about the recent trends in various fields like biophysical chemistry, computational chemistry, etc. I hope this is an excellent and wonderful opportunity that will allow all the participants to learn many new things. My dear students and research scholars, make use of this opportunity to update your knowledge. I take this opportunity to thank the organizers, Dr. Roslyn and Dr. Vidya, and all my faculty members. 
best wishes thank you thank you ma'am a pleasing welcome to dr sri ranjani armoham ma'am to take over the session uh hello everyone am i audible ah yes ma'am yes dr ranjani go ahead um thank you very much for your kind words and introduction and today uh, as ma'am said uh, today we will have uh, i will talk uh, something on uh, some of the research work we are carrying out using a uh, special type of diamonds which are called uh, nitrogen vacancy center dimer as a sensor molecule so how i have outlined my talk to introduce a little bit of uh, about sensor and various sensor type and an example and then move on to the main topic of our talk today which is the nv diamond as a sensor and uh, outline some applications what we do and finally i conclude my talk so what you see here is a beautiful picture of uh, the real earth connected with uh, sparkling dots so it's nothing but internet of things which bridges the gap between the physical world and the digital world so what makes this connection what makes this internet of things that is happening basically it's the sensors various type of sensors a wide variety of sensors which makes the internet of things which makes the world into a sensor world so we live in a world of digital communication which is made up of sensors the backbone is sensors so the sensors are uh, it's mainly at the heart of any technological innovation so as the technology advances the next innovation technology as it comes it is comes with the advanced sensing materials and methods and not only the sensor materials and also a lot of compute solutions so one of the important sensor or element is what the smart sensors for instance a stand alone sensor material can do only one job but if a sensor is smart and connected it creates a value far exceeds its intrinsic value so it can do a lot of things than a stand alone sensor so how do you define a sensor sensor has a very many different uh, definition one broad definition is it's a device that respond to any change in physical phenomena or environmental variables examples like heat pressure humidity etc so the change in this environment or a physical phenomena also affect the properties of the sensors and this sense in that way it senses that particular mechanism and gives us a output which is usable and readable so this is uh, is uh, sensors play is a very important role as heart of any measurement system so any change that is i'm sorry to disturb uh, i cannot see the slides seems like other people also cannot see the slides okay were you able to see before it looks like nobody is able to see the slides okay i'll i'll share again ranjini what happened ranjini can 
you hear me? Okay, uh, I will uh, do it again. Sorry for the disturbance. Are you able to see now? Uh, we can see you, Ranjani, but uh, not. Yeah, it's coming. Is it coming? Um, no. Um, no. No, Ranjini. No. Okay. Your uh, PPT is not visible. Okay. It shows here I am presenting. Uh, well, we can see you, but not the, your screen. OK. Oh, just uh, sorry, I'll, uh, I'll check again. Because I'm able to see here. OK. Uh, did you share your uh, screen, Ranjini? Yes, yes. I'll do it again, ma'am. Oh, yes. Or else, uh, if you send the, your uh, PPT to my mail, we'll uh, share your uh, thing. We'll share your screen. OK. Now, now, now it's, it's coming. Okay. Uh, yes, yes, now yes. It's, it's coming? Okay now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now it's okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We are able to see in our engineering. Okay, I'll go to full. Okay, yes, now I'll yes, go to full yes, screen. Yes, engineering, you can press. Yes. No. Yeah. So a uh, sensor is something. Uh, it's a name itself says it's uh, sensing. Uh, it's a device that responds to any change in physical phenomena or environmental variables. Some of them are heat, pressure, and movement, etc. So whenever there is a change in this physical, chemical, electromagnetic properties outside, it is affects the property of the sensor, which will give us the output which is usable and readable form. It's heart of any measurement system. So sensor is the first element that's going to come into contact with the variables, environmental variables, to generate an output. So they are either inter uh, uh, interpreted as a readable format as such. For instance, we have a analog or digital thermometer where to measure temperature of a body, it gives the output immediately. But there is a category of sensors which is very popular now, which is called smart sensor, where they are processed, passed on to next stage for further processing. So what are the broad category of types of sensors which are available in the market for our day-to-day -day use? It's the sensor are classified according to the based on the quantity that is being measured. For instance, temperature sensor, like as I said, the analog and the digital thermometer, which senses the temperature and which, uh, which can measure distance is proximity sensor, an accelerometer, an infrared sensor, a pressure measurement, a light deduction device, an ultrasonic sensor, and uh, the most common used is the smoke, gas, and alcohol sensor, a touch sensor, which we have in our all of our smart devices, and a sensor based on color, which can measure humidity, tilt, and flow level sensor in the construction industry. These are some of the broad category of sensor which is available to us. For, exa uh, for example, So where do these application you can see? I see, I, as I say, it's ubiquitous. That is, it's found everywhere. So some of the broad uh, areas are from medical to industrial to aerospace in sports like motorsports, agriculture, and automotive. So these are various uh, fields in which you can find sensors. 
one good example because nowadays the smart watches are very popular among youngsters and smart uh, wear wearable devices the wearable and implantable technologies based on sen sensor they are transforming the mobile health era into improving like uh, health care and health outcomes so they uh, uh, for instance a smart device a wearable device like a smart watch or a health gadget like fitbit all based on sensor elements which uh, which are flexible and wearable so they are physical sensing platforms so they are made up of materials which are solid state or liquid state or flexible template materials how do they work the mechanism is by pressing stretching bending and twisting where are the applications are for instance what we know is it can measure the heartbeat if you wear a, a smart watch it can give you a health gadget where how many how much kilometer you walk or jog or what is your run rate everything not only that this technology can be extended to have artificial electronic skin therapeutic drug delivery platforms so on and so forth so what are the materials that are used so considering the material science and engineering of sensing sensor elements is a very vast and thriving area of research here i have listed few examples of the materials that's being used are ceramics polymers hybrid materials piezoelectric materials and wide range of nanomaterials and one of the material uh, used is diamond is a topic of our, my talk today which is we all know it's an allotrope of carbon so here is a structure of a diamond which is made up of carbons a network of carbons which is connected in this fashion and it's a lot um, uh, uh, friend uh, allotropes are graphite graphite and buckyball to name a few examples so this network of carbons in this fashion makes the diamond very hard and inert one of the uh, very good uh, material science element and uh, when you have a perfect diamond it is transparent in nature so what is what all we see so far in the jewelry uh, what we get and for a jewelry is mostly uh, white or uh, transparent sparkling white diamonds so what we call this is color wheel of diamonds you can see these are all diamonds which are colored why are they colored so like every uh, one in every 10000 diamond that is got from the mines the diamond mines is colored it's colored to various changes in the properties for example the yellow one over here it's due to the change that there are few carbon atoms in the, car in the, in the carbon the few carbon atoms of the of an entire carbon lattice has been replaced with nitrogen not all of them few so it uh, it occurs naturally and the blue one is due to boron these uh, various types of colors appear not only due to the element different element present in the carbon lattice it is also it uh, it could be also due to some defects it could be also in the lattice structure changes everything is is impl implicitly coming back as a different colors and these diamonds are like as i said like you would get out of 10 or 10000 one in uh, out of 10000 and they are more expensive than the sparkling white diamond from a mining source so moving on to what is a nitrogen vacancy center in a diamond so what see here you see is the unit cell of a nitrogen vacancy center diamond so this made up of the black balls are the carbons so it's made up of uh, connected carbons in this fashion the unit cell so in the nitrogen vacancy center one of the carbons is replaced with nitrogen and adjacent to this a carbon is completely knocked out it's empty or vacant site and the lone pair of electron from nitrogen occupies the by vacant site so these nitrogen vacancy centers are we call it as defects or flaw it with the electrons with the because it has a lone pair of electron from nitrogen that can be manipulated by light and microwave so when we shine a light and they emit colored photons basically they emit fluorescence these photons when they emit the emitted photons carry quantum information about the surrounding magnetic and electric fields 
So this property is a core property of the NV center, which can be used for sensing application like biosensors, neuroimaging, object detection, and other various other applications. So why do I say as a quantum sensor? What is the difference between a classical sensor and a quantum sensor? Uh, the this uh, type of materials they obey rules of the quantum mechanics, and they are different from the classical uh, sensors. Uh, quantum sensor uh, a subset of classical sensor. You know, put it another way. So they make use of quantum states for measurements. They capitalize the fact that quantum states are extremely sensitive to disturbances. That is noises. So. They, that means they also have the potential to become externally sensitive to measuring instruments. For instance, example, we have atomic clocks, laser distance meter, and magnetic resonance imaging in the used in the medical diagnosis, all are quantum sensors, based on quantum sensors. So if you want to measure a magnetic field, we know we there are a lot of methods to measure the optical or the electrical part of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. There are fluorescence, phosphorescence, many other methods. But if you want to measure a magnetic property, what we need is a size of the sensor which is scalable to the measured field. So this NV center has a sensitivity for single spin detection, and its size is comparable to systems under investigation. So in this way, they are very helpful as a magnetic quantum sensor. The fundamental properties and spin interaction of atoms and molecules, they can be investigated as sub-angstrom level. That is, you can go up to uh, sub-nanomolar, nanometer range, and nanometer, nano-electron field. So in the unit cell, uh, this is a unit cell of NV center quantum uh, sensor. So here, this act like an atomic emitter. You can see it is not a molecular emitter. We are talking something in atomic scale, uh, nitrogen and the vacant site. So we are talking in terms of electrons, and which is a very shrinkable to an atomic scale. It absorbs green light and emits the red light. And it is very photostable. This emission, fluorescence emission, is very photostable. Electrons are trapped in the lattice, so they do not escape, and there is no photobleaching. And this type of material can be produced in uh, demand with nano diamond or bulk diamond with nanometer precision. So this um, field is experimental research. Though the concept is known for about 30, 40 years, only the experimental field is active in the past 10 to 15 years. So now how to produce a uh, center in a diamond is being optimized. So how do we produce this type of uh, single crystalline diamond in laboratory scale, we do not make use of the ridiculously expensive one the got from the mines for the jewelry. We make use of single crystalline diamond. So in, we can do it in industrial scale as well as lab scale. Industrial scale, we make use of method called high pressure, high temperature method, which produces uh, diamonds, uh, single crystalline diamonds. We can produce, uh, this is the a part of the instrument that is being used. And this is the diamond you get. There you can see it is not pure white. It is contains little impurities. But in laboratory scale, you can do a chemical vapor deposition mixture in a chamber. And there you get ultra pure materials like this. So once you have a, a the crystalline diamond, then the next step is to create the defects. So that we take the ultra pure uh, CVD produced diamond in a plasma chamber and impunge with nitrogen gas. So when you have a nitrogen gas, this ratio to nitrogen to carbon is optimized now. So you can selectively do how many nitrogen vacancy center you want to create. So you impunge it and you knock out some of the carbons and replace with nitrogen. And this, uh, this is a fluorescent image of the nitrogen centers. These bright spots are. Uh, nitrogen centers. So once you have nitrogen rich diamond, the next step is to create the nitrogen vacancy diamond. So you take the nitrogen uh, rich diamond and uh, you bombard with irradiation about 35 electron volt to knock out this adjacent carbon. And followed by, so at this temperature, the lattice collapses 
and it is it is more uh, aperture than in a very perfect lattice and then we anneal to 800 degrees centigrade in order to recreate the bonds and the lattice which will form the nitrogen vacancy center in the lab once we produce this uh, method then this is the what we call the bulk element, bulk diamond which is about micrometer in size then we we put it in the ball milling machine and we make we make very nano diamond size material which is suspended in ultra pure water and this is about the blackish color so you can see a different colors exhibition is exhibited depending upon the uh, nature of the state of the diamonds so as an optical sensor so we have this uh, ultra pure uh, crystalline diamond with the nv center when we irradiate with a green light it uh, produces the uh, pinkish reddish uh, color um, fluorescent emission and this you can see in the image these are the bright spots of the nv center so where do you make use of this application? They are mainly this fluorescent property is used as a fluorescent biomarkers because they exhibit un unlimited photostability and low cytotoxicity. So these two parameters are boon for biological system. And they are easy to detect, locally detect and measure number of physical quantities such as magnetic and electric field and in the field of super resolution imaging and quantum information processing so nano diamond as a magnetic field sensor as i told before this element the nitrogen vacancy center diamonds act as a dual sensor one is optical and it can also sense the magnetic field so when we compare the various sensor different parameters has to be considered what are the parameters that has to be considered to a material to be a magnetic field sensor is sensitivity linearity, range, frequency, bandwidth, and dimension. So it is how much small you can measure is also important parameter. So in this picture, what you see is uh, the x-axis is uh, various field strength of the magnetic field. And this is our Earth's magnetic field somewhere in the one micro Tesla range. And these are all commercially available and uh, be, be used for both research and technology purposes, different type of sensors. You might have heard about Hall and GMR and SQUID sensors. What are these sensors? Most some of them are quantum sensors. Uh, for instance, SQUID is a quantum sensor. What makes them, they have a different field of strength you can see from the ellipsoid. And what, are, what, are, what makes a nitrogen vacancy center uh, standing out from them is, is it has a very good uh, field of uh, sensing from up to micro Tesla, from pico Tesla to micro Tesla. And most of this sensor does not operate in ambient condition and room temperature. So they uh, need a highly uh, cooled temperature like cryogenic temperature using liquid nitrogen or uh, liquid other liquid helium gases. So we need to cool them in order to reduce the noise effect from the external field and then we have to use them but nitrogen vacancy sensor it can be it can be used as at ambient uh, conditions and and room temperature that's the greatest advantage of using a nitrogen vacancy sensor as a magnetic field sensor so moving on to the applications so the single spin in the diamond can be used to device quantum devices because it's a quantum sensor and it as a fluorescent sensor as an optical sensor it is can be used for sub micron molar meter cellular imaging and as a biosensor for protein structure analysis and providing and making spintronics applications so these are some of the uh, applications of the uh, in single spins and diamonds how do we image this NV defects and what, what can it be, how can it be used to define a methods using the NV defect? So here what we you see is a schematic diagram, what we constructed in our lab, which is called magnetometer, which is it's considered for microscope. So it is uh, just a closer view of uh, here the objective of the microscope. So you have a microscope uh, eyepiece, uh, sorry, objective, and in which you have a cover slip, 
in which the molecule of interest or the system of interest is put and onto which the nitrogen vacancy center diamond is also put. And along with uh, to the uh, parallel to this, uh, um, uh, we have a small magnetic field coil and uh, uh, horizontal to it, we have a microwave frequency coil arrangement. So the when we when these two are off, what we see is when we shine in a green laser light, it emits fluorescence, which is in red, which is from this side, which is from the which can be collected in the uh, using the microscope. So what you see here is an image of the fluorescence coming out. So these are the fluorescent spots, which is the nothing but the atomic size nitrogen vacancy center. And if you zoom one spot, this is how it looks the fluorescent each fluorescent spot this each one is a each nv center defect in the carbon lattice of a diamond so constructing of this magnetometry we can do a lot of precision nv magnetometric studies you all must be familiar with the uh, atomic force microscopy or uh, scm they all make use of cantilever based uh, uh, experiments so we take that AFM cantilever and attach the nitrogen vacancy center to it. So this is a schematic diagram and this is how in a re uh, real setup looks like. So you take a molecules of interest, which has its own electromagnetic field and, and they are present in different distances and different depths. So as you scan through the surface, it's like an AFM, it's like, it's a, it's a AFM. So in which the diamond is attached to the tip, as we scan through the thing, and you can see the sweeping of the magnetic field that can be sensed. So what is the advantage is you can use in reflection geometry, which is useful for non-transparent samples and thin films. The sensitivity of this method is up to one micro Tesla using this nano diamonds. So it is very sensitive technique. And this is particularly useful for studying ultra thin magnetic films vertices, domain walls, and molecular magnetics, mainly for material science uh, research work. And using this, both the properties, the magnetic property as well as the fluorescence property, we have a, what is called optically deductive magnetic resonance. We know a nuclear magnetic resonance where it make use of the nuclear spin and the using a magnet and detected using a magnetic field. Here the concept is similar, here the magnetic resonance is detected through fluorescent signals. So it is called optically detected magnetic resonance. So looking into this electronic states of the NV diamond, I'll give you a little more detail on it. For instance, it's a triplet state system. Where the electro excited is, is triplet, triplet state both in the ground state as well as the excited state. So when we pump in a green light, green laser light, uh, in the spin state, MS0 uh, state, the uh, it emits uh, red fluorescence, red light, and comes back to the MS0 state. Here, the non-radiative pathway is very less. The radiation lost is less. And it, most of them, about 90% of them, comes back to uh, ground state. So we call this as a bright state. But it's it's uh, the NV diamond system is a um plus one uh sorry uh, it's a spin one system so it has a spin one minus plus one minus one spin spin states too so in that state what happens is uh, about 70 percent of them come to the ground state whereas uh, almost 30 percent of them go through a non radiative pathway and comes back to this state m is equal to zero state so there is a difference between this uh, emitted uh, fluorescence and this emitted fluorescence so compared to this, this is called as a, so it is called as a dark state. So we have two states. So by using, by this is uh, happening when you shine with a green light, the green laser light. So at the same time, if you can sweep a microwave frequency, like the way I showed in the schematic before, you can sweep the microwave horizontal to it. When you sweep a microwave frequency, the flu and look at the fluorescent counts, and if this is a bright state, which is in this MS equal to uh, zero state, the spin state. And when it count encounters MS equal to plus one state, and there is a difference in the fluorescence between this and this. So there is a dip about 2.87 gigahertz. 
and uh, and it goes back to bright state again when we sweep the microwave frequency. This is at the field of no electrostatic magnetic field is applied. So this is a basic concept of using the optically directed magnetic resonance. So how do we make use of this and how do we sense the DC magnetic fields? So as I showed earlier, this, this um, is at a zero applied magnetic field. So you can see a resonance at 2.8 gigahertz. But when you start applying magnetic fields like 3 millitesla, 6 millitesla, and 9 milliteslas, it is started, you can see what you see is a Zeeman effect. That is the splitting of the uh, single uh, peak into its, so its uh, uh, doublets. So it varies and it is uh, it varies and it is acts like an atomic vector magnetometer. And the distance goes, uh, as the field is increased, the distance is uh, separate and you can clearly see it. So it is acts as a far field probe. And it is absolute. You don't need any calibration to this. This is uh, turn it on and you start doing the experiment. And the sensitivity depends on the line width. And they improved using coherent manipulation. So it has good spatial and temporal resolution. And to put a nutshell, this NV center is a nanoscience sensor, which is about less than 10 nanometers. And it has a long coherence time, about greater than 2 milliseconds and the magnetic sensitivity in the very good range. So in this way, you can uh, construct a magnetometer and sense magnetic field and related applications. So we have done some nanoscale NMR of proton spins using these methods with uh, using the optically detected magnetic resonance. So what we did is we took the uh, NV diamond, which is buried about five nanometer from the surface and take a water bath, which is nothing but the proton spins, which ultra pure water, and apply the external magnetic field about 43.3 milli, millitesla. So this experiment is not uh, done by the regular NMR sequence. We define uh, two different pulse sequences. One is called dynamic decoupling, and another one is dynamical sensitivity control, which is abbreviated as DISCO. So the pulse sequences are nothing but it is used to filter the spin interaction and sensing spin noise. So in the dynamic decoupling method, we could see the proton coming into resonance at 1.8 megahertz, megahertz at the field of 42.57, which is exactly what you see using a, a regular NMR experiment. The, and the advantage is here is you can see the proton spins. We are, we are now doing for various molecule, small molecule systems. We are expanding this technique to the other molecule system. This work is published. So, uh, I'm showing you this. Uh, other works are in progress. And in this system, what you see is the proton spins, which, uh, which is very sensitive. And very clearly, you can see the proton spins. So if you use the disco type of uh, sequence, what you see is not just like uh, two day two, two dimension. What you see is a three dimensional tomography, something like MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. So here we can see the how depth and how well the uh, span of proton uh, nuclear spin is over the different in the three dimensional sensitivity. So this is uh, what is the advantage? Why do you need to? go for such techniques as you all might have seen the NMR instruments, how big, how huge, and how expensive. Because it mainly, it's mainly, most of the time, the magnet needs cooling of uh, plunging with liquid helium. But here, we can, we don't need any such system. We need a small magnetometer, which can be used in a tabletop, and which can be done at ambient and room temperature. So that is the greatest advantage of this technique. And another application is with the partner group. What we did is using uh, sensing a th as a thermometer inside a cell. So we call it as nanothermometry. So this pr operational principle is uh, it relies upon accurate measurement of the transition frequency between the two states, which can be optically detected with high spatial resolution. So in this the work, what they have done is they have taken a single human embryonic vibroblast cell, 
so this uh, human embryonic fibroblast cells cell and they implanted nitrogen into it the nitrogen needs uh, sorry the diamond needs some modification and then they incorporate inside the cell and for control they also have a with a gold nanoparticle so in this state they shine green light and it emits the red microwave fluorescence red fluorescence and the field the this is swept this is also been swept with uh, microwave frequency this is a dino diamond so they do a temperature gradient control and mapping at the subcellular level so this mapping something at the temperature control at the subcellular level has a very unique potential application in life sciences to measure the temperature inside a cell or a human system or any parts of the body because the, there is a there is a known fact that for instance example for cancer diagnostic there is a temperature difference between the malignant cell and the normal cell this is one example i'm talking about so in such cases these kind of applications are very viable so going detail into the experiments so the, what you see is the um uh, 2.87 gigahertz the uh, nv center uh, frequency is optically detected and uh, with each point the difference in the the varies of laser power has been varied and the temperature is calibrated so this uses a uses a coherent manipulation of electronic spins associated with nitrogen vacancy color centimeters in diamonds so this technique makes it possible to detect temperature variation something like as small as 1.8 milli kelvin so it's very sensitive measurement which can be which can, which is derived out of this uh, uh, experiment not only the temperature sensitivity at one point they did a temperature sensitivity across various points something like you start this is the fibroblast cell image fluorescent image so this is a point a at which the nitrogen vacancy center is present and b c d e f all uh, the ones which is little far away from um from the center a so when they do this distance measurement at the temperature at the, so you can see it is sensitive and you can actually plot the temperature at different time different point scale how far it is and how accurate we can can do it so this um, uh, measure this uh, publication paved paved the way for a lot of nanothermometry uh, studies particularly in the biological system uh, and then one of the application is uh, what we did was to send metalloproteins we all know metalloproteins are the proteins with some kind of metal centers so the for instance uh, if you have to detect single protein in biological environment and using not just regular technique non invasive nano probes it has a wide range of application in the area of life sciences one such example is ferritin here is a diagram it's a picture of ferritin which has a uh, big uh, subunits of uh, alpha helices in which iron is present as a the metal core so it is a family of proteins in found in many animals plants and prokaryotes so the main function is iron storage so if i if you may not know what is ferritin some of you but everybody knows what is anemia is basically what we do is in a blood serum test uh, in the clinical laboratory is basically they take the uh, measure the concentration of iron in the ferritin so the thing concentration is blood serum is correlated with the total amount of iron stored in the body so if there is a problem with the ferritin concentration or uh, defects apoferritin present and there's no iron center present it may it makes a critical for iron hemostasis and metabolism in mammals at present uh, for anemia there are two techniques used uh, for uh, particularly when you go for iron blood uh, iron in the blood test uh, two technique use which is not direct methods they are called indirect methods it's based on colorimetry change in color another method is turbidometry in which the, they look into the iron concentrations so in this experiment what we did is so basically we implanted nv diamond in the bio, as a biological sensor into the ferritin and and look it into the its spin properties and then uh, the, uh, and then how it can be detected and quantified 
So on to the left, what you see is a high resolution TEM picture of uh, ferritin with uh, ferritin protein with uh, nano diamonds. So this is the uh, big ferritin globules in which this picture is a close-up picture of one of the globules in which is the ferritin and in which the nano diamond is present. So it's a clear picture of how it is incorporated. And we looked into the T1 relaxation time of the um, nano diamond T1 relaxation time the, by the influence of uh, Fe3 plus from the ferritin influence on it. So this is the T1 relaxation time. So in this molecule like this, the T1 relaxation time has been collected from several spots and, and constructed a histogram. So the red one over here is the uh, free nano diamonds which has an average T1 relaxation time of 41.8 microseconds, where when the ferritin is present, when it is when the protein and the nano diamonds are present, and you can see the change, it is about T1 is about 5.7 microsecond, uh, about seven to eight fold difference. So it clearly distinguish the two parts, the free and nano diamonds present in the cell culture and the one with the ferritin molecule. So, it's been demonstrated that single diamonds containing in which center can be used direct individual ferritin molecule. So this can be, which uh, presently we are doing what we do is a clinical research because this will be a direct method to quantify ferritin in our blood, that is iron in our blood. So with, uh, with uh, which distinct uh, difference between the one with the protein, without protein, you can actually quantify directly the amount of uh, uh, iron present in our blood. So this method is a sensitivity required for single protein reduction and it can be easily applied to many cellular environments and particularly uh, studying the electron transfer processes in the metalloproteins and other biomolecules. But there's some light on what we do at present and uh, what's the ongoing work. I have uh, I want to uh, show you some work, what we do now, which is using precision sensing using tapered fiber. So uh, everybody knows about fiber optic technology, particularly of the high-speed internet. And uh, the fiber optics is like a sensor element. It is a, it's also ubiquitous and found everywhere these days. So we make use of this optical fiber to excite the nitrogen vacancy center and also collect its fluorescence essential to build NV-based flexible sensor. Basically, it's not like one place, you have it like a flexible sensor. So it's not only at one place. So for any measurement, you don't need one spot. You can actually do multiple spot. So it is called multiplexing sensing. And you also get not from one spot, you can simultaneously get signal from various spot. So you can actually multiplex sensing and simultaneous signal uh, sensing from several distinct spatial location. So here it's the pretty pictures of uh, microscopic imaging of how we attach uh, into an optical fiber. We take an optical fiber and onto the end, we attach the diamond. And this is the um, where parallel view it, and this is the cross-sectional view of the diamond. Uh, and the la green laser light, when the green laser light is sent, you can see that it emits the red fluorescence. And these are the various type of, uh, this is a big diamond we attach to it. And this is the time of flight fiber. And this is a fly, flat fiber end. And uh, you can see, depending upon the configuration and the size of the diamond, you can see different types of fluorescence can be obtained. So this can be further uh, extended to different applications. One such application, what we are doing with our clinical medical hospital is, is ongoing work. Uh, to make an NV fiber optic based endoscopy. We all know about endoscopic methods. Uh, some of you might have undergone diagnostic using endoscopic methods. So we are constructing a state of art endoscopic method, which will have a long flexible tube, this one, uh, which is, this is called endoscope. And it all, its length and flexibility depends upon which part of the body doctor wants to see and a fiber optic light a camera lens and another channel that can be used for other medical instruments if necessary. So basically whatever the tip which say is will be replaced with is we are replacing with 
fiber optic with uh, attached to a nano diamond and we can we can with that we can do a lot of imaging uh, in ambient conditions another uh, application what we do with medical school is to construct a nv based magnetoencephalogram to image the brain which is called which we termed as nv meg so you may ask, um, are there not any MEG available? We we have that is conventional MEG picture over here. You can see a person sitting with a huge magnetic uh, detection system on his head. So this is like uh, you can see bulk. It's mainly bulk. The sensor element is small, but it is, but uh, the uh, but why it is bulk? It's mainly it needs a cryogenic cooling temperature, and it is fixed, and you cannot move it to wherever you want. It's not portable. So in this um, uh, graph, which talks about the spatial resolution and the time resolution for various imaging techniques that is used for brain imaging. For instance, PET scanning, which has a less spatial, good spatial resolution and a less time resolution. Functional MRI is good, and MEG is better, better than functional MRI, and which is the best system available right now in the market. And our NV system imaging falls in this range, which has a good spatial as well as a temporal region, which is between MEG and MRI. So how do how, how are we doing it? Basically, as I told you before, we have a fiber optic cable, and in the end, there will be diamonds attached to it. So you can put all across the head to image the brain at various points. So at various points, we can do multiplexing and we can also collect the signal simultaneously. So in this way, we can do a beautiful NV image at room temperature and it is portable and uh, less cost effective compared to the conventional image. So with it, I move on to the conclusion. The um, so from the talk you would have understood the development of sensor development field is fast developing, and every day there is a change. Micro nanotechnology, novel materials, smaller, smarter, and more effective electronic system uh, will play important role in future of sensors. So this field is fastly evolving every day. Every day there is a new finding in this field. And this opportunity for such emerging technologies using NV defects are not only limited to the application I talked about. I gave you as a time constraint. I gave you only a few examples, which we can we are doing it with it. But there is a in the broader sense we can do it for brain computer interface, augmented prosthetics to point of care medical diagnostic devices. So this NV defects uh, based. Um, instrumentation and the technological development, it has a very huge impact on biomedical device uh, device uh, development and research. And uh, looking into the prospects of the diamond quantum sensor, it's very promising. It is not only to deliver new tools and technology, and it also to uh, face the current challenges and contribute towards the benefit of humankind and beyond. So with it, uh, I conclude my talk and I move on to the acknowledgement. So most of uh, this uh, uh, work has been done with uh, Professor Gopi Paras Brahmanyam and his group. At present, we moved to Leibniz Institute of Surface Engineering in Leipzig, Germany, also at Leipzig, Leipzig University. Majority part of the work has been done. We just moved here. The major part of the work is done at Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry, Gottingen, Germany. And the, our funding sources are uh, Max Planck uh, uh, Institutes, uh, Volkswagen Stiffen, and um, uh, DFG. This is the major funding source for us. With the acknowledgement, uh, I move on to wish you all a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year from Germany. And I have a joyous season ahead and a holiday season. And and thank you for your kind attention. I'm I'm open to questions now. Thank you, ma'am, for enlightening us with the with your interesting beneficial lecture with the really lot of applying ways and examples and visuals, ma'am. Girls, now you can post your queries, whatever you have in the chat box. 
Ma'am, shall I uh, deliver the questions one by one from chat box, ma'am? Sure, 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 sure. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. The question is, uh, which character of nitrogen responsible for this ultra sensitive, ma'am? It is not just uh, nitrogen. It is also the vacant scent. So the nitrogen and the vacancy scent are adjacent to it. Uh, act like a atomic emitter. So particularly the vacant center is not stable, but it is stabilized by a lone pair of electron from the nitrogen. So technically it has to be called as NV minus, but for practical purpose, we always call it as NV center. So this is what makes it more ultra sensitive. Probe. Thank you, ma'am. Students, any other questions? You can post it in the chat box. Ma'am, the question is why a sensor is called transducer, ma'am? Okay. Um, tra it is like a transducer is a broad term where it is which is responsible for uh, changing one type of signal to another type of signal. For instance, if you give a um, mechanical signal, it will give you as an electrical signal as output. That's a transducer. Uh, sensor is a part of a transducer. It's a special class of transducer. It's called sensors. Thank you, ma'am. Students, do you have any other questions? You can ask whatever the doubt you have. Yes. Ma'am, the question is, in anemia, which technique is preferred more, ma'am? Okay. In case of anemia, what at uh, present, um, as I discussed before, at present, what we have in labs, there are two methods. Uh, one is based on color change, colorimetry. Other one is based on turbid, uh, turbidity of the sample, this turbidometry. So they measure the indirect. Uh, it is not direct measurement of uh, the iron concentration in the blood but uh, if we develop something like direct measurement it will be more accurate so it will be more precise and sensitive compared to the indirect methods thank you ma'am the next question is yes. it it cause any problems to our body ma'am when we no we are not in cop uh, well uh, it has very, very low cytotoxicity. That means it has very toxic for the cells. So, and it can be eliminated in your system. So, it, it is because it's very small size, it is implanted for any studies. Um, I have not shown you an example in which where they did with live animals uh, using like a, a mouse model or a rat model. So, people have done it uh, with the, using the nanometer and it can, it is excreted in your system. So it is very, very, very low cytotoxicity compared to some of the other pro. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for your patient listening of all uh, queries and make it clear. It's really helpful comments, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Now I invite Arul Murugan, sir, to take over the session. So hello all, very good afternoon. Are you able to hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And what about the slides? Uh, you are able to see the slides, right? It's visible, sir. Okay, okay. So then uh, let me start. Sir, yeah. Okay, so let me start my presentation. So I'm going to talk about uh, computational and medicinal chemistry. 
in the end i will see whether i will be able to give any you know introduction to data driven approaches because uh, uh, ranjini asked me whether i can you know give some details about that but recently you know we have been working in this topic also but uh, let's see you know uh, i think i have to give uh, you know i have 45 minutes i guess right yeah anyway so already you had given me a nice given you a nice presentation about uh, myself uh, but uh, so what i wanted to share is that i i'm also having a background in chemistry okay i started uh, my you know bsc chemistry from uh, place where you know you know that place i also did my masters in chemistry from uh, jrd university then of course i moved to iic bangalore for phd uh, from there you know i know sri ranjani so of course these other details were given by the organizer already so let me skip this so this will be my overview for my presentation today so i'll be giving like uh, you know uh, introduction to modeling you know computational modeling uh, because i think uh, you don't have any uh, computational chemistry or you know computational medicine chemistry in your uh, curriculum so i will give uh, you know very general introduction to modeling and uh, then you know i will talk about like how we can use computers for uh, drug discovery projects little bit i will talk about the scoring function and then in the end i will talk about the data driven approaches okay so uh, before i go into the discussion you know i would like to ask this question like uh, how superior are the human sensors you know uh, already you know sri ranjini was talking about uh, diamond sensors you know <laughs> um, but then you know humans also have uh, very many sensors like we can hear you know we can see uh, we can sense the radiation of different wavelength Uh, we can also see you know uh, audio waves uh, listen to audio waves then uh, we can also sense uh, you know various uh, smells right so we have also very many sensory very many sense sensing uh, organs in our body right but then are these uh, superior than uh, than that of the other animal that's a question i want to ask here but if we here i have given just few examples like you know like um, uh, the animals bats you know some of them they have better sensory um, capability than us as you can see here you know certain birds you know they can even um, um, uh, see this uv radiation you know then uh, for them you know the world looks looks more colorful than what we see uh, that is one thing and also you know about the, the dogs you know which are used for uh, uh, bomb sniffing in um, you know airports as well as recently you know they have been also in uh, finland you know in helsinki airport they have been exploring uh, about the use of uh, dogs Uh, to sense uh, coronavirus you know uh, that's another interesting application uh, of course you know that uh, bats can you know um, uh, sense the um, ultrasound uh, waves uh, through that you know they can catch the uh, their food okay so there are certain animals which have better sensing capability than humans so our human um, you know sensing is has its own limitation okay so we cannot see Uh, certain uh, length scale you know we cannot see we cannot send some processes happening at a certain time scale right so we need to use some other probes like you know as you can as twenty uh, mentioned you know we can use some sensors and XR and type of instruments or or spectroscopic tools to understand what's happening at the microscopy world okay Uh, so the point i'm trying to say is that you know the real world is uh, very complicated you know and then uh, we probe it um, in our own way uh, and then um, so we may make uh, you know uh, we make conclusion based on uh, what we perceive it may be correct it may not be correct depending upon how well you made the uh, observations and measurements okay so there are three different ways to probe the uh, universe uh one is the experiments like um, as we heard in the earlier topic you know you can use different spectroscopic tools or you know experimental techniques to understand the microscopic world uh, also you can use uh, you know theoretical uh, techniques like you can use um, you can write down simple equations to understand um, you know certain process uh, then you can solve it and then see what happens um, at the end okay so that's an analytical way of solving um, you know some equations and try to understand the system uh, of course it, long back before computers came into picture you know that was the um, way to understand uh, the uh, process but now we have you know very fast computers so now we also have something like computer computer computational modeling approaches 
so overall three different approaches we have experiments theory and then modeling okay so i'm going to talk about modeling uh, so the idea is that we can use computers um, to understand a process it can be like protein folding you know or polymer segmentation motion um, or maybe reaction di reaction dynamics any chemical process biological process okay then even you know we can address questions why certain things are the way you know they are like you know we see many things around us and why they should be like that like for example you know why this uh, wood should be like this and then uh, why water should uh, evaporate at the higher temperature than ammonia so you know like you can ask many questions um so we will be able to understand uh, you know uh, the reason behind that using uh, the modeling techniques and the modeling is you know not limited to or even using uh, uh, computers modeling techniques in all the domains okay so uh, i have listed a few of them here like drug design the diagnostic agent design then abinisio materials design then of course we can understand uh, protein dynamics and folding also the other domains like you know weather prediction aircraft modeling you know share market modeling uh, shock and crack propagation nuclear explosion all these things can be modeled using computers okay um and the, in the right side i do so you won't figure like where you know you, like the honda uh, car company you know they are using the modeling software to understand uh, what happens to uh, you know the cars when they collide on certain walls you know how the um, how the shock propagates into the car and then how the material deforms um, with respect to this you know external shock okay so you can see that the model and then actual um, the process you know they are almost the same so you, you know this is like non non destructive way of understanding the system okay you don't you really don't need to you know uh, use a real car to see like what happens how the car will you know get damaged when it collides on your wall or something you know or when it meets with some accident rather you can really do a models okay in you can build a model in computers and then you know allow this to happen and then see how this um, the, how the car deforms uh, you know with respect to this external shock or you know external uh, obstacle okay um so now what i'm going to ask is like um, okay so we use computers in many different fields uh, but then why do we need to use computers okay and uh, if we if, and then how do we use the computers you know in chemistry or in medicine chemistry? that's going to be my discussion now um so because you know the dirac said long back in 1929 you know he said that uh, quantum mechanics has uh, you know um, answers to all the chemical problems okay uh, like the real, so what he is trying to say is that uh, chemistry is not any more chemistry but it is simple mathematics okay so by solving certain mathematical equations will be able to um, explain any chemical systems like about its stability or you know whether the reaction will form or not um, or whether a protein will fold or not you know all these things you know or why certain things uh, why certain proteins uh, you know fold in uh, very limited uh, you know takes longer time and certain proteins fold in no time so such type of things we can answer but just by solving you know mathematical equations so that's what he put forward but and then um, that comes because uh, you know the quantum mechanics is a more you know fundamental theory and uh, the world whole world you know works uh, based on this uh, principle uh, so if we can solve this schrodinger equation you know then we can explain you know many of the things um, so that is a key point but then it is covered by something like schrodinger equation which is uh, mathematically very complex so we cannot solve it by uh analytical methods so that, that's the reason we need to rely on the computers and you know we are going to see like you know, more in about that later uh so before going into the actual uh you know the classical mechanics quantum mechanics uh, i will just show you that you know uh you can solve any equations uh, numerically right so the only way is like you know how to solve equations numerically is that you need to um do, uh, set up a iterative procedure where you start with a guess um, and then uh, you know you solve for f of x then uh, you know use that f of x x x then uh, you know iteratively you can um, solve certain equations okay so here i just show you an example like how to solve this equation 
So you first write the x is equal to f of x. Then uh, you know you just start with the guess value for x. It can be even just zero for uh, you know as a guess. Then uh, at the end you will see that after certain uh, iterations, you know you will see that uh, you are able to reach the solution. Okay. Um, you can also uh, you know by hand you can check this, but then you can write a small program in computers. You know then you start with this equation and then um, put it in a do loop and then you know. Um, you can um, once you can say that if the solution reaches certain threshold val value, then uh, you know you stop the uh, you know computation. So you can set up such things. Uh, so the idea is that you know you can solve mathematical equations iteratively using computers. Okay, you can write some small programs and then you can solve any equations. Also, this is uh, you can just refer to this link uh, you know where um, you can find how to solve a set of linear equations using an iterative approach. Uh, so these also there is a book called you know numerical uh, recipes. Um, I think um, you know they there are they also have given uh, programs written in Fortran also in C. So this is like a bible for uh, you know numerical um, solutions to mathematical equations. So you can refer to this book, and uh, it is very important that you know that we get good good hand in uh, solving these equations using programs and. Uh, because as I said, like uh, mathematics is uh, not anymore mathematics, but uh, you know it is a fundamental um, things governing you know chemistry um, or biophysics. Okay. Um, here, you explain how since uh, now we are going to see the real world problems how we can solve them using um, numerical solution. So there is this approach called molecular dynamics. Uh, so what we do here is like we solve the Newton's equation of motion, uh, say function of time, uh, for uh, a system having n particles. So the idea is that once we know, know the initial uh, position and then force acting on the system, so we should be able to follow the system um, as long as we want. So the, that means like we know the whole phase phase of the system. Once we know the initial position of the system and then force. So once I have the phase phase, you know, it means that I can compute any property of the system. Like it can be like a structural property or any dynamical property. Um, so in uh, molecular, you know, in classical mechanics, uh, if I know the phase phase, then I know everything about the system. Um, so, you know, I can compute uh, these properties like G of R sub Q, which are, uh, you know, measured in uh, experiments like uh, XRD or Newton scattering measurements. Um, so same way, you know, I can compute this dipole autocorrelation function, which is related to IR spectra experimentally. Same way, you know, I can compute polarizability autocorrelation function, you know, in uh, computation, which is related to Raman spectra. And so like that, you know, any of the property can be computed once we know the positions and moment of the particles as a function of time. Okay. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, so what we do is we start any, you know, whenever we do a simulation, we start with the initial coordinate. Um, it can be like uh, random or it can be, if, uh, you can start with a crystalline structure. So we have, you know, the um, position at time t, uh, then, you know, we can start with um, velocities as a zero. Then once you know the position at time t, you know, you can always compute the acceleration at time t and then use that for computing the new positions. As I shown you in the right side, you know, you can compute, um, you can predict the new positions using the old position and the old acceleration. Uh, same way, you know, you can also uh, predict the velocities uh, from the old velocity and, you know, old acceleration and new acceleration. Okay. So this, what we do is we keep on doing it, um, you know, maybe 10,000 times or 100,000 times. Um, and then we store the position and the velocities. As I said, like once we have the positions and velocities, then we know everything about the system. Okay. So this, you know, you can uh, you can also do it in paper and pen if it is like one atom system or two atom system, but then uh, it becomes very complicated for, and it becomes impossible for a yeah, uh, bulk system where we you know we handle with um, Avogadro number of atoms. Of course, in simulation, you know, we still don't uh, reach uh, Avogadro number of atoms, but rather you know we deal with like uh, um, hundred thousand or you know or millions atoms at a time. Because you know, then we also use certain approximations like uh, periodic boundary condition uh, or minimum age condition 
to mimic uh, to bring in you know like bulk life effect in our simulation system simulating system okay so the now you know you understand the reason that why we need to use computers so the idea is that we want to get the um, position and momentum of the particle as a function of time let us start within a zero time and then let us you know we want to um, estimate this position and velocities over a time scale of like 20 nanosecond okay so then you know i can um, get any thermodynamic property or structural property or uh, you know or energy related property uh, from these um, stored coordinates and velocities okay uh, so since it is like too many times i need to do and then it, uh, there are too many particles there is its only way is to do is like we need to use computers okay so nowadays you know there are many built in softwares like you know gromax amber you know uh, dl poly many of, many of them are even uh, you know free wares you know free softwares you can just download them install them and then you can play around and learn about uh, these technique okay uh, maybe this is this i can skip but then you know you can do molecular dynamic simulations and then you can uh, um, address the stability you know for example here this uh, uh, others you know they have uh, studied uh, satellite above mosaic virus so what they have studied is, you know, what is uh, this capsid um, uh, capsid uh, protein, you know, like uh, capsid how stable it is. Like so, what they addressed was that uh, without RNA core and you know with RNA core they studied this capsid and then you know they see that uh, the capsid as such is uh, not stable without RNA core. Um, so it becomes stable only when there is RNA core. Okay. So the idea is that so you can address the stability of uh, uh, even white particles using molecular dynamic simulation. And then here is another example. You know, like um, this is a KJV capsid structure, uh, the molecular dynamic simulation center. And then the right side, what you see is from cryo electron microscopy. So the thing is. Um, you can build very realistic models of the you know virus particle, which are you know otherwise very difficult to assess. Um, and then once we build it, you know we can have very good understanding about um, the system. So that is the idea. Um, not only that, you know we can address the stability of the you know virus particles, but you can also address the infection process of uh, the virus. You know. Um, like how it uh, interacts with the human uh, cell receptors and what are the molecules involved in the uh, handshake with the human cell receptors um, and what stabilizes stabilizing this type of uh, handshake all these things you can address using uh, the molecular dynamics uh, simulations okay only thing is you know it needs um, too much resources you need uh, like uh, uh, petascale or exascale type computing facilities to study such systems okay um, so this is just a slide to show that you know like what is the length scale that we can assess using uh, computer simulations these days uh, so it was like in 1990 you know one can only study like lysosomes on like small proteins but now you know people can even study uh say uh, capsid or you know even uh, this coronavirus spike protein um, so such a big systems you can model these days so we are getting more and more uh, resources we'll be able to study even uh, bigger length scale systems and uh, you know bigger time scale processes using the computer simulation approaches uh, so this is just to show you that you know the b factor which is um, experimentally measured you can also get it from uh, computers you know once you have the trajectories you can calculate the um, uh, root mean square fluctuation um, then you know which is related to b factor uh, you can understand about uh, you know this uh, how the ligand binds and uh, you know because of ligand binding what happens to the uh, targets so what is shown here is um, you know the loop in the KJV, sorry it's beta secretase you know you can see that um, before the ligand binds you know the they are like very flexible but then once the once the ligand binds you know they becomes a bit rigid okay so you can understand like uh, the structural dynamics uh, uh, various target uh, ligand binding. Okay, okay. Let me skip that. Um, so the classical mechanics, uh, so you know that it can explain many of the things. Like it can, uh, we can address the stability. Uh, we can also understand uh, the processes, like infection process. 
um, or membrane penetration of molecules. All these things can be modeled using molecular dynamics uh, simulation based on classical mechanics. Okay. Um, so the classical mechanics works fairly well, but then you know, like uh, when there are when the particle dimension of the you know the system that we are interested in um, becomes comparable to that of the photons, you know, then uh, the classical mechanics fails. Whether the more fundamental theory, quantum mechanics should be applied there. Okay, uh, and in uh, quantum mechanics, you know, many interesting things happen. Like you know, like we know in classical mechanics, uh, the particles cannot penetrate through walls. But then in quantum mechanics, it is not uh, completely um, misallowed. That means even uh, particles can penetrate through uh, the barriers. Uh, we call it as like quantum tunneling. That can happen. Also, you know, in classical mechanics, whether I do or you do or anybody does, you know, the, observer, obs uh, uh, the observation is the same. Um, that means the role of um, observers is uh, not very important. But in quantum mechanics, it is not really like that. So then there is a possibility that uh, you know the observers <clears throat> um, play you know to some extent with the outcome of the experiments <clears throat> that is not completely you know uh, misallowed. So it can happen. Um, so such things are then happening in the quantum mechanical world, and rather uh, our world is uh, more quantum mechanical in nature. Okay. <clears throat> so the quantum mechanics is a theory you know which is supposed to explain. Uh, everything um, but in uh, certain cases like when the system is uh, you know when the system size is too big uh, like let us say satellite or you know or planets or even uh, you know the um, uh, bulk materials then you can still use classical mechanics okay so in uh, quantum mechanics uh, what is dictating everything is the wave function okay so once i know the wave function I know everything about the system, uh, so I can use uh, the Schrodinger, uh, you know, time-independent equation to solve for the wave function. Then once I know the wave function, I can compute any property. Okay, uh, the most fundamental properties uh, energy, energies I can compute. Uh, then many properties, you know, like uh, you can take any properties like uh, dipole moments or uh, you know chemical shieldings or uh, absorption spectra or photophysical properties, you know. Uh, uh, any property you consider, they can be written as derivative of energies. Okay, to with respect to certain field. So once I know the wave function, I know everything about the system in the quantum mechanics. So I need to build this. Uh, you know, you can mathematically build this wave function as a linear combination of um, um, one electron orbitals or one electron wave function. Uh, then you know you have this variation principle to optimize the wave function. Also, you know, we use uh, many other approximations. You know, like for example, um, when we solve this uh, Schrodinger equation, we assume that um, the nuclei is stationary. Um, so, for the given set of nuclei, we solve for the uh, wave function. Okay, uh, because if we also allow the you know nuclear nucleus to move around, then it becomes more complicated. Um, so, we use also you know we also there is something like uh, mean field theory. So, we assume that. The, um, the electron interaction, uh, you know, so we, 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 you know, we model the interaction between electrons here uh, as a field. Okay, it's like uh, the electrons are free. Electrons are moving freely in a background of uh, a field. Okay, so this also gives that you know we really don't need to uh, solve very complex mathematical equations. Um, but then you know because of that such approximation, you know, we are uh, missing some accuracy. Uh, so for that reason, you know, there, are, there are many, very many different approaches uh, in solving the Schrodinger equation. So we have Hartree Fock, you know, or Muller Pulsar theory. Then we have like uh, SCF, um, multi configuration SCF, coupled cluster. Uh, so there are very many different uh, ways to solve the Schrodinger equation, and then you know they, they differ with respect to um, accounting for the correlation effect in a different way. Uh, Hartree-Fock theory doesn't account for correlation effect, but then you know the other theories they account for the correlation effect, but then because of that they become very expensive. So the point I'm trying to make is um, the problems that we are trying to deal with, or you know trying to solve, is uh, multi-dimensional. Uh, if you take classical mechanics and uh, if you are trying to do molecular dynamic simulation, then uh, you know the number of degrees of freedom we are dealing with is six n. Okay, where n is number of atoms. Okay, um, why six n? 
three n for uh, you know positions and three n for uh, momentum coordinates. Okay, and then you you are trying to do Monte Carlo simulation. Then number of degrees of freedom we are dealing with is three n. Okay, because here we are only dealing with the configurational phase space, so only we are dealing with the positions only. So no momenta here. So we only have three n uh, degrees of freedom in the Monte Carlo simulations. So even you are dealing with like million atoms, you see. Then you know the three n. Uh, so you know the, the, the size of the dimension that we need to deal with. Um, and as I said, when we go to quantum mechanics, okay. In this case, you know when you are um, calculating energies, you know they you the um, the expression goes as n power two. Okay. So that is the um, um, cost um, of the you know. Uh, mathematical operations involved in this uh, classical mechanics okay but uh, when we do when we are trying to do uh, quantum mechanics then you can see that it goes as n power 3 or even n power 7 depending upon which method we are using so where n is the one electron wave function uh, so even if you have like 20 electrons you know then you see that n power 7 it goes really too big uh, it's really impossible to handle uh, so that's why you know then uh, there is no other way that we need to use computers to solve these complex mathematics okay so math, the um, the advantage is that uh, the computers can do the mathematical operations uh, very fast and then you know they can uh, they have big memory you know you can uh, can store the you know for all the atoms you know let us say million atoms you can store them in the file you can read them all and compute properties so this you can do it in computer. Also, another interesting aspect is like the parallel processing. Nowadays, you know there are many supercomputers, um, so you can do computation in parallel. Um, the advantage is that you know you can split the computation into independent parts, and then you can send these uh, each independent part to certain uh, you know node or uh, processor. Uh, once the computation is done, you can collect the data back, and then you know you can. You know, see, uh, put them together and uh, you know, get the results. So that is the advantage. So only thing is that you know, whatever mathematical equation we want to solve, you know, it has to be converted into a way that it can be solved numerically. So as I said, like in the beginning, you know, you have to when you want to solve equations, mathematical equations, you have to switch to iterative approach. Okay, the same way, you know, here also, like whether it is classical mechanics or quantum mechanics, you have to convert the equations into numerically solvable way. That is the most important thing. Okay, so the advantage is that you know the ex experiments are very time taking, um, also expensive and destructive. Sometimes it can be even uh, life threatening. You know, but then the computational modeling, we don't have such issues. So, we at present you know we have um, computational models to predict anything like you know structure of um, any materials, also dynamics of any materials. Uh, also, you can um, study these materials with respect to external variables like temperature, pressure, or pH, or electric field. Um, also, you can understand uh, you know the free energies associated with the association process. Uh, I think this I'll be talking a bit more because you know whenever you are interested in the drug discovery, uh, you are interested in optimizing the free energy of binding between the protein and ligand, right? So this is an interesting other property that we are, uh, you know, we are interested in our drug discovery projects. So you can also, you know, do other um, uh, other prediction like electron structure. You can predict and uh, how the light interacts with the matter. You know that you can predict. Uh, so light matter interaction in the external system like uh, green fluorescent protein, you know, green fluorescent protein, um, or or cone protein. You know, uh, so that also can be modeled using. Uh, approaches. So now you know we have all of me methods to solve, uh, to understand, uh, or you know, to predict uh, all these um, things like structure, dynamics, uh, properties. It can be like electronic, magnetic, uh, or uh, you know, any photophysical property. Okay. It's just a issue. You know, like uh, the data we get from uh, modeling, they can be very well compared to the experimental data. So this is uh, coming from my own paper. Uh, which I did during my you know, visit to UPC, uh, uh, Spain. Uh, so figure you see, you know, it is related to SFQ, you know, structure factor uh, for 1,2-dichloroethylene uh, in uh, 
for the low temperature and high temperature um, uh, liquid you know basically it has uh, interesting feature liquid liquid transition so here we have computed uh, you know um, they did this neutron scattering measurements for the low density and the high density liquid and then i did the modeling for both um, you can see that there is very good uh, agreement between experiments and model okay um, but then in terms of cost, if you see, you know, this uh, whole computation I did with one desktop at the time, you know, it was uh, taking a one week time or something. Uh, but then, you know, you, you really don't know, you know, it's, it's like, like really very expensive, you know, to neutron scattering measurements. Okay. Sometimes you have to wait in the queue and then, you know, you have to spend, it involves a lot of uh, time and, you know, cost. Uh, also, you just uh, don't need to rely on many other things. You, you just you yourself can do things and then get the data out. And this is another um, uh, interesting data, interesting result, where I tried to show you the comparison between the modeling and the experiment. And this is related to modeling photophysical property of your uh, acid probe, OK, uh, or pH probe. Um, so pH probe in the sense, you know, like um, these molecules uh, are very sensitive to the pH in the environment. In the acidic pH, you know, they exhibit certain color, and then uh, when you change the pH to basic, uh, you know, they also change the color. So just by measuring uh, the absorption wavelength, uh, you can really see what is the pH okay, of the system. It's very something very similar to what uh, Anjani talked some time ago. But then, you know, you can also model this um, you know, pH dependent photophysical property of this dye molecule using the models. Um, so we have models available which are very reliable and very predictive. So that's the point I want to make here. So now let me move on to this uh, drug discovery, you know, uh, how we can use computers. And um, as you know that, you know, the drug discovery project is uh, very time taking. Uh, it takes like 14 to 15 years um, to bring uh, a drug from basic research uh, to the market. In addition to that, you know, it also involves like quite a lot of um, cost. Um, this is the um, value given here is like quite old. Uh, now even they say that it's like uh, more billion uh, dollars. You know, it takes to develop a new drug. So only corporate company can do this. Okay, um, but then you know we will see that you know like this can be this can be challenged. You know, like. Uh, Thanks to like competition facility we have now, even individual can be doing can be you know part of this uh, drug discovery projects, and uh, one can contribute with the uh, lead combat optimization. Uh, and in the end, I'll be a little bit talking about uh, some results in this area. Um, so that looks promising, you know, like uh, moving uh, so, yeah, certain research uh, from the hands of uh, corporate world to individual researcher, you know can be made thanks to the computation facilities and software available nowadays. Okay. So not only that, it is uh, time taking, it is also uh, involves uh, very careful search over chemical space. Um, so, so the usual experience is that uh, you start with uh, 100,000 compounds and then there is a chance that you end up with one drug molecule. So you see that, you know, the, over this uh, whole period, uh, how much um, resources you are using, okay. Uh, so you'll be using a lot of chemicals, you'll be using, uh, you know, a lot of um, binding assay, you know, facilities like uh, calorimetric facilities, uh, also a lot of uh, human resources. Um, so the idea is that if we can use computers to uh, reduce the, you know, the chemical space, um, then, you know, I can cut down the cost. And um, but then the problem is whether this computation models are they reliable, you know. So we'll be a little bit, I'll be discussing about that aspect as well. Uh, but then there is a good chance, like for example, if I can reduce the ample space using computers, I can cut down the cost and time in order for you yeah, involving the drug discovery. So that is the idea. And uh, as such, the drug uh, design is a very, you know, multi variable optimization problem. Uh, so we are try interested in optimizing these all these properties. So your drug molecule should have these properties. Uh, like it should have uh, very high binding affinity towards a specific target. Okay. Uh, and this target, you know, 
is specific to each disease. Uh, let us say, you know, you, you want to come up with a drug molecule for, uh, you know, COVID-19. So then, you know, these targets are known, you know. Uh, so these are the targets which are uh, very vital for the uh, coronavirus. You know, we'll be seeing some, uh, you know, targets which are very important for coronavirus. And then, you know, these targets should not be uh, present in the human. Uh, so there are certain things that we need to uh, take care when we are uh, identifying potential targets. Uh, so the one is the binding affinity, binding specificity. Uh, so the, these are all the properties which are very important. In addition to that, you know, we also need to optimize these ADMET properties. Um, many times, you know, people only give importance to binding affinity and binding specificity. And then they ignore ADMET, but then that uh, has contributed uh, you know, many problems in the later stage. Uh, so, for example, in the preclinical trials, then the compounds are you know not having very good um, pharmacodynamic or pharmacokinetic properties. You know, then um, you need to um, give up this compound. So the best strategy is that you can simultaneously optimize all the properties. Uh, then the number of failures can be reduced in the clinical trial phase. So these are the properties that we are interested in, a drug molecule. Um, and here I list like in what are the ways computers can contribute to the drug discovery projects. <clears throat> One thing is, you know, we can use, uh, uh, you know, data mining tools to further target discovery. So once you have the genomics data, you can, uh, you can always uh, do subtractive uh, you know, uh, genomics um then you can find out suitable targets a little bit i will discuss about that also then you know you can um, use uh, homology modeling um, i will little bit uh, in detail go into these uh, topics um, so, so the first thing is like uh, target discovery um, you can do comparative or subtractive genomics to identify potential target um, so you know nowadays we have uh, rich genomic uh, genomics data uh, let us say, you know, normal subjects, that means that people don't have uh, certain diseases and then people are having uh, certain diseases. So what you can do is, let us say, you know, the, you want to identify a, a target, so potential target for um, Alzheimer's disease, let us say. So what you have to do is you have to see, you know, uh, you have to collect the genomic database of uh, normal human beings, normal human subjects, as well as the people having Alzheimer's disease. So you identify the certain genes which are expressed in the case of deceased people, then you can, uh, you know, uh, consider this can be a potential target for treating the uh, Alzheimer's disease. So you start from there. You start, uh, you do the uh, subtractive genomics, and then you identify the targets. Of course, there are, there are other steps like target validation and all those things. But then, uh, you know, this um, subtractive dynamic genomics can be only done with the help of computers because so like you have whom huge database, you know, you have huge data, only computers can handle this. So here I have listed, like, uh, discussed, like, how we can find out um, the target for uh, infectious disease, like uh, mycobacterium, caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, so the idea is that you find out uh, the proteins, um, which are uh, very vital for the microorganism, but which are not uh, present in the humans. So that is the um, way to identify the potential targets. Okay. Um, so when it comes to you know infectious diseases, uh, there are a number of uh, potential targets. Maybe you know the cell wall synthase or uh, limousine synthase because these are all not present in the human beings. Um, and then when it comes to uh, you know like diseases like cancer, uh, Alzheimer's disease. There we need to find out, you know, what are the enzymes or you know biomolecular targets that are expressed in the disease condition. Uh, then you know you can try to target them uh, or inhibit them, which can uh, you know lead to therapeutic uh, the way. <clears throat> so that's about uh, target uh, discovery. And then once you find uh, you know uh, a target uh, biomolecule, then what is the next step? You need to identify or you need to yes, get the 3D structure for the uh, target. Because um, in order to find out, so the, you know, so what I'm discussing is that how we can use computers for the drug discovery projects. Uh, the first thing is like I talked about uh, target uh, identification. Uh, 
uh, by doing you know like subtractive genomics you can get the um, relevant targets or potential targets once you have the target you know you can try to get the 3d structure uh, why we need 3d structure because uh, you know once you have the 3d structure you can always uh, try to do some docking you know it's called virtual screen uh, by taking the commons from chemical space you know you can put inside this uh, binding site and then see which molecules are strongly binding this uh, to this uh, binding site um, then you know you can take out those compounds as lead compounds okay so that's the idea so in order to do the docking you need to have the three dimensional structure for the uh, target so in the target uh, you know discovery step we only have the sequence and then now we need to get the 3d structure and even for that you know we have uh, the tool in uh, uh, computational uh, modeling which is called homology modeling okay so what it does is that once we have the sequence uh, we can propose structure uh, for the sequence um, but then only thing is we need to have the uh, some templates you know about this protein data bank right so it's, it has uh, um, the structures for solid proteins so what you can do is you can uh, use this protein database to solve the structure for uh, the targets with uh, for which only sequence is known okay um, so this is called homology modeling okay so you can uh, take out the um, target sequence and then you can identify suitable templates uh, then based on the template structure you can propose the structure for the target 3d structure for the target okay um I recently you know you know about something break some breakthrough happened uh, which is called uh, um you know like deep deep blue something you know like uh, google's um, one of the um oh, i'm forgetting <laughs> it's it's deep mind okay deep mind uh, you know it's, it's one of the i think the uh, company uh, part of uh, google you know they solved the 3d structure for uh, uh, proteins using um, ai okay so that was a breakthrough which happened recently like you know there was so much news about that uh, so the idea is that you know you only have a sequence and you want to propose structure for uh, this uh, sequence and it used to be a challenge all the time you know like uh, um, many times you know we even though we have the homology modeling like, tools uh, but then you know they are not all the time uh, you know, 100 percent predictive uh, moreover you know they are not a issue right um, that means you know we use certain template uh, structures but then this uh, AI approach you know that uh, it is uh, it's more like a issue um, uh, first it learns from the um, available crystal structure uh, so it gets some details about the sequence and structure and then use that uh, you know learning to predict structure for a yeah, given sequence and uh, the breakthrough was that uh, the resolution was almost uh, close to the experimental resolution okay so that was a breakthrough happened last week you can check um, later like it's called uh, casper okay casper challenge uh, they even say that it hasn't solved after 50 years anyway so now you know once i know the 3d structure um i can find out uh, the binding sites i think it's a little bit i'm running out of time so i will uh, uh, i'll go a bit fast so you can identify the binding sites you know there are tools available um so once i identify the binding site then now i need to identify the compounds or you know compounds from chemical space which can bind to this uh, binding site okay so i know the um, target i know the 3d structure of the target i know the binding site so what is the piece i need to identify the compounds uh, from certain chemical spaces which can bind to this target very strongly and then you know there are like very many different chemical spaces available like zinc uh, cambridge you know specs so there are different chemical space and you can see that the dimension of the chemical space the zinc itself has like uh, this many compounds 230 million uh, compounds and even even we have bigger chemical spaces like zinc -lic has like 16 million compounds and then gdp 17 has like 166 million compounds so all these things make you to feel that you know uh, that uh, makes us to be convinced that you know uh, there is no other way that uh, we need to use computers for the um, screening or uh, such uh, you know calculations okay so now the next step is that you know um, i have the target i have the ligands uh, from the you know i can always pick up some uh, compound from the chemical space 
now next thing is how i can identify that which are the compounds which are uh, you know uh, lead compounds okay so the further that to define some scoring function you know the scoring function tells me that uh, which compound will uh, very strongly bind to the uh, given target okay so this is a very simple scoring function used in uh, the autodoc one of the most popular uh, um, software used for screening uh, as you can see that it has uh, various terms like um, uh, protein ligand uh, wonder walls protein ligand electrostatic interaction protein ligand hydrogen bond interaction and in addition to that there is uh, terms to add the change in internal energy of the ligand when it binds to the protein so added together it will give me a value and then i will use this as the scoring function so lower this value then i will say that that will be a potential lead compound um okay so that's uh, very straight forward so we we have the, we can use this scoring function to identify um, the lead compounds okay so what do we mean by lead compound identification you know i have I, as i told you like i have millions or billions of compounds i can uh, i want to identify like top 100 compounds which can bind to the target with a very high binding affinity okay so i can use this scoring function for doing that so such virtual screening have been you know uh, i think they're quite uh, useful and uh, this is one uh, important outcome um, from such virtual screening so what i'm showing here is like uh, in the left side you know you are using uh, high throughput screening experimental technique um where you use like 400000 uh, com 400000 compounds and then you identify identify hits okay but then if you are using um, virtual screening computational virtual screening um of uh, you know 235000 compounds and then you identify like top uh, 360 compounds and then use that for experimental validation then you know you are already getting 127 hits so that means you know from less than 1% of success rate now you are able to increase it to 35% success rate with the use of computational screening so that is the advantage you know you can bring as i in the beginning as i told you you can bring down the cost you can bring down the time uh, for uh, you know doing this experimental validation or experimental lead compound identification using computers also you know the um, the popular uh, hiv drug ritonavir you know came to market in 8 years you know, as i told you that usual time is like 14 to 15 years but here with the use of uh, in silico approaches uh, one could design uh, the ritonavir uh, this uh, drug molecule uh, which is inhibitor for hiv protease okay which is one of the main important target in the hiv uh, disease um, so this is another just a demonstration that you know you can cut down the cost also the time with the use of computational approaches and there are many other uh, stories success stories of uh, you know computer aided drug discoveries let me not uh, go into that but then you know it is not all the time uh, um is it that i can take uh, 10 10 minutes is that okay hello yes sir okay yeah 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 okay see um so um it's not that you know all the things are uh, very green like uh, all the all the things um the computational approaches are not that you know um, all the time giving the 100 percent successful lead compounds there are certain issues okay so i'm going to discuss about that in this slide uh, then how we can move forward from there you know that, that's the thing i'm going to discuss now for next to five ten minutes and then i will wind up okay um so we have even though seen that the, you know the virtual screening is successful but then if you see the number of compounds uh, came from the uh, in silico approaches uh, they are not many actually you know you can count them maybe like you can 10 15 or 30 you know all the drugs uh, which came from silico drug discovery okay computational approaches uh, but then you know we have like uh, I think more than 3,000 uh, drug compounds currently available. Uh, so with the help of computers, what you achieve it is really not so much encouraging. Okay, uh, but but that that's really very strange, you know, um, because you know we have rich uh, genomics database these days. We also have big chemical space, as I told you earlier. Also, we have like very good computing facilities, right? So we should have been uh, we should have been more successful, you know, to bring more drugs um, from computational approaches. But that's not the reality. And then this has attributed to the 
inaccuracy of the scoring functions you know i talked about one scoring function in the slides uh, but then there are you know very many other approaches and then the scoring functions are not accurate um, not only the binding affinity you know even uh, the other properties like solubility distribution coefficient permeability uh, even these properties also very difficult to predict um, and uh, one reason is that you know these properties can be written as uh, uh, the free energy differences of the ligand in two different environments. For example, if we take permeability, it is a free energy of uh, ligand in uh, two environments like water and membrane. Um, same way, you know, you can write down the um, uh, binding affinity. It is a free energy difference of the ligand with the target as well as uh, in uh, water solvent. Okay. So all these uh, properties can be written as free energy differences of the ligand in two different environments. And the problem is that, you know, we, we currently, you know, the methods for computing the free energy differences are uh, not uh, that reliable. So we need to estimate the free energy differences to within a few kilocalories per mole accuracy, you know, so that we are able to predict these properties very reliably. Okay. Uh, so what I talked about was that, you know, it is like very simple scoring function, but then uh, there is a way that, you know, we can improve, um, this um, accuracy of this free energy differences or you know we can calculate this problem uh, different approaches you know as i told you like these are all like uh, classical force field based but then as i said the more fundamental theory is quantum mechanics uh, so one can use uh, the approaches using um, in volume quantum mechanics to compute these properties okay then uh, even your predictability will be much better your uh, scoring data will also be improved um, so I've been contributing to developing such uh, multi-level scoring functions. You know. So we have been trying uh, a double scoring approach, also a triple scoring approach using quantum mechanics, also machine learning based uh, approaches. Um, so uh, I will just quickly show some uh, you know, uh, results from uh, my own contribution to this subject. One thing is like with the use of, um, you know, uh, autodoc like uh, scoring function, you can see that the predictability uh, is very poor. Uh, so what I saw here is the binding affinity um, of uh, certain pet tracers with uh, aminoid fibril. Uh, so you can see that there is no correlation at all uh, as predicted from the autodoc based scoring function. But if we are using uh, you know a bit more advanced scoring function like using MMGPSA, you can see that there is very good um, agreement. Okay. So with the use of double scoring, you know you can uh, improve uh, the predictability. Um, that's the one. Um, point I want to register here. And then this is um, again uh, from Autodoc. Um, so what we have done here is, you know, we have uh, screened the drug uh, com compounds from drug bank database against uh, four different viral targets. Okay. And what do you see here? The, you know, you see that almost all the drug compounds have negative binding uh, energy, which means that, you know, all the drug compounds are, uh, have at least to some extent, incubatory potential towards the various targets, which is, uh, you know, which you can say that it is, uh, that this data is, uh, you know, false positive. That means this autodoc based scoring gives a lot of false positive. Uh, so for that purpose, you know, we use a double scoring approach. Okay. So you first uh, rank it with the autodoc uh, based scoring, then you use a more accurate approach to again, re-rank these complexes. Okay. So, the, um, and then, with that approach, you know, we are able to identify many uh, drugs for, uh, you know, uh, different coronavirus targets. Uh, so not only that, you know, we also are able to identify multi-targeting drugs for coronavirus. Okay. So this work was, you know, very well uh, highlighted in the KTH news. Also in, um, you know, various news media in uh, India as well as outside. You can see that uh, India Today or, you know, um, or uh, uh, many other news agencies, you know, they covered our research. Uh, it, this all this happened uh, during last week. So the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that it's like we are like few people did this research and then, you know, uh, and we are able to propose certain drug molecules. Of course, this has to be validated. Uh, but thing is that uh, the important thing is that uh, like, um, uh, as a researcher, you know, we, we ourselves can now contribute to the um, drug discovery project 
which are otherwise very demanding. You know, as I told you that in the beginning, it is uh, too much expensive and too much time taking. But thanks to the computers, now we can contribute to this uh, subject enormously. So that's a that's an important uh, you know uh, thing to I want to register here. Uh, now let me explain uh, you know like uh, one more um, important data uh, from our um, double scoring method. Um, so in particular, this compound, you know, it is uh, shown to be very specific to amyloid beta fibril, uh, but not to other fibrils. Okay, so it is shown in this uh, fluorescence intensity fluorescence measurement done for this uh, sensor molecule in different uh, targets. So what you see is that only when it binds to amyloid beta, there is uh, fluorescence uh, manifold increase in fluorescence. Okay, so this shows that it uh, binds very strongly to this amyloid beta. And with uh, our uh, you know calculations, we are also able to show that only to amyloid beta, you know, the binding free energies were in the range of minus 14 to minus 30 kilocalories per mole. But then for other fibrils, it was like uh, quite high. It was like minus four kilocalories per mole or something. So this clearly shows that why this uh, you know CQ probe molecule binds very strongly to the amyloid beta, but not to other fibrils. Okay. So then here we have addressed. Uh, uh, like uh, off-target binding of molecules um, using our uh, computational calculations. Um, so the problem is that you know there is always um, off-target binding in any um, any molecules. Uh, like you know, for example, we need to reduce off-target binding, as I told you in the beginning. But then many of the tracers nowadays used, you know, they may have significant off-target binding. And then, you know, these tau tracers, which are uh, supposed to be binding only to the tau fibrin, uh, but rather, you know, they are also shown to be binding to mononoxid B, which is also coexisting in the brain with the, uh, you know, other fibrils, amyloid or tau fibrin. So the tau tracer, you know, which, this is only supposed to bind to the tau fibril, but then, uh, you know, experimentally it was shown that, like THK 5351 tracer, you know, uh, seems to be binding to this mononoxid B to some extent. So then we did uh, some uh, computational calculations to uh, understand that is it really there that uh, this uh, is it really that these uh, tracers bind to mononoxid B. Um, and when we did the study, you know, we also see saw that many of the tau tracers it seems like they are bind to the mononoxid B. Um, and for that, you know, we use the sophenamide as the reference compound. And uh, as you can see that many of the tau tracers also have comparable binding affinity to that of the safinamide. Um, so most of the first generation uh, tau tracers uh, were shown to be binding to monoxidase B, which is uh, you know which is not uh, really expected. You know. So this will lead to possible misdiagnosis. Um, so we need to identify the tracers uh, tau tracer which will only specifically bind to the tau fibril. And then you know we also looked into certain uh, second generation tau tracer, and we find that these second generation tau tracers they are not binding to the uh, mononoxidase B that strongly. So the outcome of this um, study is that uh, even though the first, gener first generation tau tracers bind to off-target mononoxidase B, but then uh, one can use a uh, second generation tau tracer like uh, pyramal compound PA2620 uh, for the diagnosis purpose. So you can really get such insight from the model. Okay. Then recently, you know, we have been also working on um, developing diagnostics for uh, COVID-19, and uh, we have been using uh, uh, both open and closed forms of the spike protein. Uh, the idea is that you know we are screening these uh, optical probes uh, from the optical probes database. So we are identifying the compounds which are binding to both the open and closed form of the uh, spike protein. And then, uh, so we could identify certain uh, compounds now. Okay. And then uh, now we, we have been collaborating with the Karolinska. You know, we are trying to even validate it experimentally. So then, the, you know, the advantage is that this is like optical probe. You know, you can use um, RT PCR, you know, or uh, antibody testing. But these all are going to be very expensive. But then here, the one we are proposing, you know, they are it's based on optical imaging. So what you do is like you collect the sample from the uh, patient. Then uh, you know you just strain it with this uh, optical probes, then wash away. Then if you still see this uh, you know, optical signal corresponding to this dye, then you know that this person has uh, in coronavirus you know, 
uh, or you know COVID-19. So this type of um, uh, you know setup is quite cheap. You know, it's very cost-effective. Uh, so the idea I'm trying to say is that you can use uh, computational tools to identify such optical probes for various diagnostics uh, purpose. I think um, I maybe I will spend like few more uh, minutes and then I will quit because it's like too much. I don't want to really take too much of your time. <laughs> but anyway, you know. The, so here I'm what I'm saying is that. Um, the force field methods, you know, like sometimes both, like even um, autodoc based or even MMG, they say, you know, both can fail. Okay. So um, you can see that uh, what I'm supposed to get is I'm supposed to get y equal to x type of plot. I should get a linear plot, right? But then here I'm getting y equal to x type of plot. That means like these uh, methods are not able to really predict anything. Um, so of course the, the, this has been some reason why you know the computational approaches have not uh, brought so many uh, drugs okay uh, so i you know, rather we need to develop improved scoring function okay so as i said uh, one can use uh, quantum mechanics uh, theory to predict uh, or you know to develop more uh, reliable scoring function but then as i said uh, the system we are dealing with is like uh, like quite big a protein ligand complex you know right so we'll have like like uh, 10 000, 20 000 atoms i told you that these approaches are like uh, the computational expenses like n power 3 or n power 7 right so i cannot really use this quantum mechanical approach um so i need to make certain approximations okay so there are like different approaches like qm cluster model qm fragmentation scheme and qm um, um, and in fact i have contributed to all these uh, three different approaches the idea is that you know i want to compute the um, I want to compute the binding free energies uh, using quantum mechanics theory, but then quantum mechanics theory cannot be applied uh, for uh, systems more than 100 to 100 atoms. But then my protein ligand complex has like 10,000, 12,000 atoms. So I need to make some approximation. Okay. Um, and then uh, these are the few approximations uh, I have worked on. Of course, you know, we were able to get um, uh, good results from using such scoring functions with involving the QM. Anyway, I'm not going into that. But as I said, you know, the quantum mechanical theory is so expensive. Um, so uh, what is the next alternative? I can use machine learning approach. Okay, So the machine learning approaches are very robust, very fast. Uh, only thing, you know, they rely on the data set. Only thing is I need to have rich data set to predict something. So, you know, I give my data set to the machine learning model. So it learns uh, from this uh, data set. Then when I give you a new set of uh, compound, you know, then it can predict uh, based on what it has learned. So that is how this machine learning approach works. Um, okay, so so what it did not see is that first of all, you know, the feature extraction. Um, let us say, you know, I, I I give you a chemical space of inhibitors and non-inhibitors to a machine learning model. So what it does is it computes various descriptors like molecular things or physical chemical properties, or rule of five, you know, so all these uh, descriptors it computes. Uh, then, you know, it um, it tries to learn, pick up which are the descriptors uh, that are suitable for a molecule to behave like inhibitors, and which are the descriptors suitable to describe uh, your molecule to be non-inhibited. Okay, it learns from these uh, models. Then when once I give you a new molecule, you know, it gives again, uh, you can compute again these descriptors, then based on the descriptor value, you can get, you can predict whether this compound is uh, inhibitor or non inhibitor. So this is how all the machine learning model works. Okay. Um, so once uh, we use, uh, we have also used, as I said, like machine learning based uh, model. And then, you know, this is the same system I showed you earlier, where, you know, we have seen that almost flat curve uh, between the um, predicted and the calculated value. But then with the use of machine learning approach, you can see that the prediction is really very good. You know, there is, we see that very good correlation between the experimental and uh, predicted binding affinities okay so the machine learning models works very well also you know this this type of calculation just takes like a uh, uh, few hours in your desktop but then the quantum mechanical calculations it may runs for uh, a month runs for months together you know on a big supercomputer center uh, so that way you know the machine learning models are uh, you know very superior um, and then uh, they can be used for drug like property prediction 
So that's uh, the point I want to make. Then this I told you, like in the earlier case, the earlier slide, you know, I mentioned about this cast challenge, which has been solved after 50 years, it seems. Um, so the sequence was given, and then you know the deep minds alpha bold, uh, alpha fold, you know, that software could predict it's a AI based software, could predict uh, the structure. And then you know, later they compared with the experimental uh, data. You can see that the comparison is really good, actually. You know, so so this gives a hope that you know, uh, as I told you earlier, that the drug like properties are very challenging to predict. But here, you know, with the uh, AI based approach or machine learning based approach. Uh, the hope looks, um, you know, it can be very positive. So, so with that, uh, you know, I will just mention that I'm also working on, uh, you know, the color modeling and the molecular probes, the probes which are suitable to uh, probe different uh, microenvironment like DNA or fibril um, or even membrane, you know. So this is my other research area other than what I discussed so far. And uh, with that, I will uh, conclude that you know, these machine learning approaches are looking very promising, and you know, even uh, challenging drug-like properties can be predicted. Uh, and I have been contributing to this subject uh, recently, um, and I would like to thank uh, Professor Lima Rose for giving me opportunity to present about my work. I think it's a bit <laughs> uh, different from what you have been uh, hearing. But it is very important, you know, to you just need a laptop you know, just install Linux and you get all the free softwares uh, you, you know you can install Python Fortran you know you can download data sets and you can even download this machine learning programs like uh, TensorFlow you know Vika you know so it's uh, time to you know play around you can use your computers in a very useful way like at least uh, two few few hours a day and then you know this um, using computers um even this year you know this you might have seen that many people couldn't publish much papers but then uh, myself could publish still you know 10 12 papers even this year because i do only computation so you can do it from anywhere anytime you know and it's you only you know it's even motivation which uh, matters a lot in this case so with that i will stop my talk and i will uh, if you have any questions sir now thank you very much Thank you, sir, for your uh, elaborate elucidation about computation and models. So now we will move into the queries of our students. Okay. So, so the question is, is drug design is related to mm -hmm. medical coding? Mm, yeah, the, so drug design is uh, related to finding a lead compound which can potentially inhibit a uh, given target. Okay, this target is, uh, you know, specific to, uh, you know, for each disease, there is a specific target. Okay, when it is Alzheimer's, you know, we target uh, specific uh, enzymes or uh, protein. When it is cancer, you know, we target different enzymes or proteins. So the drug design means, like, we try to identify a chemical compound which can inhibit these targets. Okay. So once we inhibit, you know, so the person is relieved from the disease-like state. So that is the main idea. So here I discussed like how we can use computer to identify such lead compounds. Uh, it can be for any disease. The you know the theory is the same. Yes. I hope I yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Students, any other questions? You can post it in the chat box. I guess maybe I already took too much time, so sorry <laughs> for that. <laughs> it's okay, sir. So the question is, what is mean yeah, by... So I could see that, you know, there is oh. some question about autocorrelation function. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so the autocorrelation function is, you know, yeah, um, so what you do is like your property at time, how it is related to property at another time, you know. So you can calculate the velocity autocorrelation function. Uh, that means uh, V at time t related to V at time t plus delta t, you know. And then you can average this over uh, various uh, you know, time step. Uh, and this velocity autocorrelation function is related to um, you know certain properties. Like for example, uh, it also related to diffusion coefficient. Okay. So from trajectories, you can compute this velocity autocorrelation function. Uh, as I told you, you know in the MD we store both positions and velocities, right? So using velocities, I can compute velocity autocorrelation function. Uh, 
and then this is related to diffusion coefficient okay how fast um, you know the liquid atoms are moving in the liquid or even in solid okay um, so yeah so that's what auto correlation function means it's like a, um, you can compute from the molecular dynamics trajectory and then you know it is related to certain measurable property Um, yes, I see that uh, there is a question about um, um, how much helpful to find drugs for COVID. Okay, yeah, actually, you know, like um, um, yeah, the we ourselves have contributed uh, to this subject. I told you, you know that we have come up with um, target specific and uh, you know multi-targeting drugs, which was published in some scientific report uh, recently. Uh, so we use the compounds from drug bank database. You know, the good thing is like uh, once you take the compounds from drug bank database, uh, this means its compounds were already known to be drugs. Okay, so you don't need to really test for other uh, radio emitting properties. Okay, as I told you, you know, when you are uh, identifying a drug compound, not only you need to optimize binding affinity, but you need to also optimize radio emitting properties. But if you are taking compounds from chemical, uh, you know, drug bank database. Then you know these compounds were already known to have favorable pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic properties. Okay, so you already don't need to test for uh, such um, properties. So one thing here you want to optimize is binding affinity. So once you find potential compounds, then you know you can really quickly go into the clinical phase or you know the testing of these compounds. So that is the advantage. You know use of methods, use of uh, uh, proper uh, properly selecting chemical space. As well as use of properly choosing reliable scoring function, you can really you know fasten this drug discovery process. Okay, so there are so many compounds uh, now um, you know from computational modeling compounds have been proposed. Only thing is now people have to validate it in the experimental condition. Um, so the drug discovery computational drug discovery can be quite useful. Okay, not only that you know recently you know we also have worked into this phytomedicine. You know you know that like in uh, Siddha medicine we know very active components, right? Uh, so we have published a paper and it was uh, even you know interviewed by the tv channel and you know it was also published in a journal um, it was well received that's the point i want to make so there what we tried to find out was that you know we could uh, find out uh, the nilavengu you know there are certain active component which is shown to inhibit um, at least few of the targets in the coronavirus so that means you know the, this way with the computation model you can even try to give insight to uh, our you know knowledge which we have for uh, you know many generations uh, or you know th or thousands of years <laughs> so we know siddha medicine is working but then we don't know the microscope mechanism right but now with these models we can try to come up with such uh, knowledge like uh, what is a microscope mechanism against the siddha medicine working i think that is something that is uh, very interesting that uh, yeah and we have been contributing to that as well yeah yes um yeah, actually, you can use um, not only you know drug dis uh, based uh, drug discovery approach, but you can also use uh, uh, ligand based uh, drug discovery. Um, that means, um, let us say you know you don't have, we don't have the target structure. Okay, uh, then uh, is it that uh, we cannot do anything with the computer? No, still we can do something. Uh, and called you know ligand based uh, structure, uh, ligand based drug discovery. So what we do here is, you know, we get a um, data, you know, chemicals, we get data set of compounds with known uh, inhibition, you know, inhibition potential. Then with that uh, chemical space, we can build a pharmacophore, okay. Um, pharmacophore is nothing but, you know, the molecules merged over on uh, each other. Then, you know, the so we also know the active functional groups of the pharmaco of the inhibitors, okay. So once you build the pharmacophore, you can screen against any chemical space to identify the uh, compounds that have uh, same features like the pharmacophore. And then once you identify this top 20, 50 compound, then you know you can take it for the experimental validation. So not only the structure-based uh, drug discovery, you can also do ligand-based drug discovery using the computational approaches. Yeah. Thank you, so sir. You really don't need the 3D structure for the target. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your understandable clarification of all our queries. And uh, mm -hmm. thank you, sir. The okay, essence thank of all. <laughs> thank you very much for listening. Thank you, sir.
the essence of all beautiful art is gratitude now i invite dr vidya ma'am vice president of chemistry association department of chemistry holy cross college to deliver the oath of thanks the purpose of education is to make good human beings with skill and expertise a quote by dr apj abdul kalam we the holy crossians always equip our students with appropriate skills knowledge and values at this juncture i first and foremost thank the almighty who has showered his blessings upon all of us for the successful completion of the international scientist week 2020 thank you lord it's my great pleasure indeed to thank our dynamic principal dr sister christina bridget and our lovable secretary dr sister niranjana antoni sami in their absence here for their constant support and motivation towards the innovation path thank you sisters on behalf of the holy cross family i express my sincere gratitude to our alumna dr sri ranjani arumugam senior scientist lapsic university germany we are really enlightened with your knowledge and presence ma'am we understood the overview of sensors different type of sensors and its applications such as optical sensor magnetic field sensor quantum devices biosensor spintronics nanothermometry and how it will help in medical diagnostic devices we also very happy to see that you are lively and active interaction with our student and answering their queries i hold heartily thank you ma'am for your valuable presence i extend my heartiest gratitude to professor arul murugan senior researcher department of theoretical chemistry kth royal institute of technology sweden sir we acquire a knowledge about how data science relates with molecular modeling drug design weather prediction computational fluid dynamics and how computational facility will help in drug discovery project to optimize binding affinity and binding specificity we hold heartedly thank you sir for your valuable presence i express my profound thanks to our head of the department dr a lima rose associate professor department of chemistry holy cross college for her commitment and strenuous effort for the upliftment of students community thank you ma'am i extend my sincere thanks to the teaching fraternity of chemistry department holy cross college for their support and cooperation in all our department activities thank you teachers i also extend my heartfelt thanks to the research scholars and students of our college for their valuable presence Once again, I thank each and every one of you. Thank you. Nivedha, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Um. Thank you, Dr. Ranjini and uh, Professor Murugan, for your wonderful uh, speech, and uh, really all the faculty members, research scholars, and uh, students, UG both uh, UG and PG students will be benefited out of your uh, uh, tremendous uh, knowledgeable and. Uh, Uh, work uh, talk of both uh, Ranjini and uh, Professor Murugan. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thanks, madam. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, madam. <laughs> yeah, Ranjini, it's pleasure to meet you all. Mm. Yeah, welcome, ma'am. It's very pleasureful to meet the uh, Holy Cross community again. Yeah. Uh, all the senior staff members conveyed their uh, wishes to, to Ranjini. 
Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I'll see you some other time. Uh, Professor Murugan, when you visit okay. to India, uh, try to visit us. Okay, ma'am. And you are welcome to Holy Cross College then. Yeah. Definitely, ma'am. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, definitely I'll come. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir.